very much for the brief intro. So what I'll do is I'll try to take you away from any case studies to a certain extent and maybe go back to the roots in a sense and then reiterate the cycle all over again and hopefully we'll end up with something significant that this session can contribute here. So um, in this case I wanted to just briefly summarise my view of what a skyscape is and then present a methodology to further explore that uh, presented uh, by Robert Smithson a while ago. Um, then putting it in context, uh, shame on me, I've included a case here, so walking aside Garden's Edge that I've been looking at um, and drawing on uh, that site and illustrating some <coughs> aspects and then going into the visualisation as one way of offering what a skyscape could be and actually then maybe going back to the roots of re-analyzing what skyscape actually is and what it means, concluding hopefully in a sensible manner at the end. So somehow you might find some definitions. Uh, I know Fabio and I had uh, lengthy, never-ending and always reiterating discussions. Uh, a attempt of myself was uh, possibly a cultural contextualized sky. Um, if I expand it in a way, then in, I see how sky, land and people meet. So this is a way how they make sense of each other within each other's context as well. So there are many ways of trying to access that and these might be very strongly defined through place experiences. So that gets at the base of um, understanding place, understanding being, understanding dwelling and going into beyond just noting down an observation then disappearing to prolonged rhythmic engagement of the site, i.e. watching, which I proposed as, as one way into a skyscape experience as well. All that is at its root is, is a deep engagement, something that takes you beyond just setting foot on a landscape and perceiving a interpretation of skyscape, but trying to get, as I've put in here, a, a kind of dialogue where you can feel that you're in touch with what is there. And the importance is this two-way kind of dialogue that you're actually experiencing what is happening, that you're feeling you're having a response from what you're seeing. And at that point, you feel skyscape is not that much material, but happens instantly, and there's a point of recognition where you feel that suddenly there's a moment that flashes up, that illustrates that you now understand this dialogue, this feedback. But that doesn't need to be fully understood. That doesn't even need to be fully repeatable. So we've made several attempts trying to look at that with Solarium, for example. There's my little clip on uh, current work that we've been doing in the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, trying to make sense of skyscape as well. Um, and I've been struck by, by ideas how to, for example, be able to recreate a paleo skyscape, trying to see how we can uh, learn about what a skyscape is and what the components could be. Um, being faced with the challenge of trying to look at that, I've been also uh, curious about different um, creative practitioners' approach to that. And one, um, coming from the land art movement, this is from the US land art movement, Robert Smithson, um, not with us anymore. Um, he's proposed um, as one aspect of his, his work um, these non-sides. So it's an interesting um, uh, concept. I've tried to outline it here a little bit, what a non-site actually is. So in a way, these non-sites um, sprung up in a museum environment. Now, Smithson, being a land artist, um, sees these as non-spaces. A museum space is clearly something that has no space whatsoever. It is contextualized and it's not, it's not actually contextualized, it's empty for him. So he's actually using this vacuum to bring in aspects of a site. So this might be maps of a site, sample boxes, and in a way he's now creating this non-space a site. But this is actually not a site itself, it's something that points outward, it points away from it to the actual site. It's bringing in from a site um, aspects and then interprets them further. So it's quite interesting that it actually points away from the site. It's also quite interesting that he plays with this idea, non-site, site, pointing, trying to negotiate what is what, and also intentionally, I think the phrases he, he used there is also sight and a non-site, like seeing and non-seeing. This kind of uh, opposing aspects that seemingly play as a dialectic. And this is also his way of playing with perceiving, playing with seeing. Um, and it's quite important for him that that uh, that's not resolved, this dialectic. This is something that he intentionally puts up there 
to remain out there and to be not fully resolved. So I'm taking this now from uh, Smithson's Unresolvable Dialectics, and then that part, um, this brief paragraph, tries to sum that up. Uh, sum that up. So if Smithson's art rests on either or propositions, it will not be so difficult to understand. But rather than an either or situation, he created a both and proposal. With a both is either or, the and adds up to confusion, and the combination of the three terms is equally valid and useless at the same time. So a clear distancing from being able to solve this kind of dialectic and actually make sense of it. So this is a brief uh, citation I'll leave that to you to read or listen to me, up to you, where, where we're talking again about this site, non-site idea, where this non-site is clearly something that points to a site. Having this in the back of the mind and accessing the site actually causes a lot of problems because you suddenly feel you're always pointed away and actually what you're trying to access is never really there. It's sort of ephemeral. It's very difficult to grasp. Are they actually non-sites? Are they actually sites? Or is this not just a whole flowing sequence of different uh, approaches to a site? Let's bring that back to Earth, back on Earth, back with the Earth, to actually walking a site. This is Garden's Edge, um, a beautiful site, very small scale, has a, a very rich history taking you through Mesolithic, through the uh, Bronze Age, um, into Victorian drift mining, right up to current people using the uh, uh, ridges for climbing activity. So if you're walking this site, what you would do is you would approach this site from a non-site perspective. You would go to uh, your local bookstore or your app uh, store, download an appropriate map of that site, and at this point you're accessing the site very clearly in a way that you're actually not going there um, in, uh, as a first instance, but accessing a virtual recreation of the site. So as you're walking through the site, you're, you're coming across that over and over again. Yes, you find a triangular monolith. This is the standing stone that I was uh, doing some work on. Yes, you find out that it's millstone grit. You can feel it, you can touch it, you can analyze it. You can see the boulders and rocks around that that help to tell a further story of this site. You can see the ridges, the plateaus. You can uh, go up a gradient. You can see the watershed where water would flow either the one way or the other. All of this material, um, stuff defining the site itself defines what is around. However, all of that comes part and parcel with, well, you're going there with site plans, with an OS map, you know what is where on a map to then go and approach the site. So all of that suddenly plays in that you're seeing here. I've highlighted two <coughs> natural monuments, three ships, which are uh, three distinct clear boulders, on the right with this pinky red dot, on the top left there's a very striking boulder. These are um, um, uh, mon natural monuments that can be viewed at certain areas in the inner part of shaded them bluish <coughs> or pinkish. Uh, with the standing stone avoiding these, these uh, visibility or intervisibility regions. So again, this is actually something that's not material as such, it is what you can see, so you're being pointed away from the site. Um, in a further way, you're actually experiencing the site during daytime or nighttime. You're seeing shadows, the standing stone being interesting because it casts a very intriguing shadow, becomes one with its shadow at certain times of the year as well. All of that pointing to a very good understanding of the sun's path, something that is clearly not material, clearly something that isn't there but points away from what it is. So what we're seeing here is actually when you're engaging with the site in such a manner that you're always in between the actual what is here physically but also what is not there, what is virtual. So in a way you could say that the site or the non-site, both of that, all of the experience in there sort of lives somewhere in between in your negotiation of what is material, what is non-material, what is there, what is not there, the site and the non-site. And I'm leaving it open to you to add the GH or not to site here. So that part you can now try to go beyond that and try to sort of look at what I would call a challenge visualization. So we can use, we heard at the beginning from Georg, um, Stellarium software. And I've tried to do that as well and embrace quite a lot of the kind of options that um, planetarium software gives you to be able to simulate all the components in the sky, being able to recreate rhythmic patterns and see how time passes, to wind back time to see how the sky would have looked like millennia ago. Now all of that somehow also gives you then a, a fascinating engagement of how 
how we can use, we've heard about uh, the landscape features in there. So we can make sure that this landscape becomes richer, we can make sure that this landscape can then have components that have meaning for us. So at that point, I'm using as an access way of in, uh, getting into that sort of what's called dialectic, Im dialectic image or dialectic landscape. So I'm using a way of being able to present all the components in one go, never enforcing a narrative from above, always allowing people to for themselves negotiate uh, this. And in this way, this will allow the viewer for themselves to come up with meaningful interpretations without me having enforced upon them what is there. But this is all, all very challenging because what it does is it, for sure, requires me to fully engage in a deep manner with the landscape, for example, Garden's Edge, to recreate this visualization. So I am creating a very deep skyscape experience, but it's very re important to realize that what I'm actually creating is a skyscape ver um, experience, a version of that. And that version is very, very specific, individual to myself only, uh, at this moment of time as I was then. So it's quite important to actually, as I see it, stress that there is no the skyscape experience. That just does not exist. Skyscape experiences exist, but the the experience does not exist. What is far more important, I think, is being able to, through the engagement, fathom a kind of framework in which we engage with the skyscape and develop an experience. Understanding that is by far more important than being able to express a skyscape experience, which will just be a experience, one of many. If we have that framework, then we can use that to more meaningfully hang up a narrative around a possible skyscape that we are looking at and developing and trying to understand. So in a way, what I'm now trying to take you is back to the beginning, to what is a skyscape. So I'm finding this quite, quite interesting that this non-site site has taken me to actually looking at what a skyscape, what a non-skyscape is. So in a way I can see this perfectly fine that uh, skyscapes do actually exist. I can see that perfectly fine that skyscapes don't exist, the actual non-skyscape exists. So there are actually places where maybe there is nothing there that in any form or manner can justify any kind of skyscape. I perfectly find, uh, understand that there is actually both. That there is a skyscape out there that we can understand and that there is no skyscape whatsoever that we can understand. I'm also perfectly fine with that there is a skyscape there that we can understand and that there is a clear non-skyscape that has no belonging, no meaning, no understanding for us at all. All of that is valid. No, no, it is valid. So you can come up with your own meaning. This is very important from my point of view to go back to how I engage with the landscape in this dialectic manner. So I'm now not enforcing any kind of uh, narrative in here. What I'm actually showing is a perfect non-linear engagement where everything is possible, nothing is possible, all is possible, some of it is possible. It is for you to decide and it is for the individual to uh, understand the meaning for themselves. As you're doing so, what you're actually experiencing are brief glimpses of what skyscape actually is. And that's the important bit, these gl brief glimpses, these brief moments that then throughout give you a constellation, a set of what skyscape can mean. Never saying what it is, but always remaining uh, with you sort of a core essence that in a way you might say, touches on the sublime of the sky and empowers it and shows meaning of it, but that's up to you to decide. So, I've not seen the five minutes. So, what I'll try to do is sum up a little bit what I've said. Then I've got more time for more questions. So, I've hoped to give you an idea that skyscapes can be quite powerfully explored by looking at sight and non-sight through this dialectic that's potentially unresolved. What I've tried to illustrate is that skyscapes can't be recreated at all. But we can, as a non-site point towards a site, we can try to develop ways in which aspects point towards a skyscape experience. We've got the pointers. We can never figure out what it actually will be, but we can string a story together that might make sense. And if you want to take a message back home, I'll put it here. Skyscapes are... 
but they're definitely not. And as a result, they can only be. Maybe tellingly, what you can take back home is having felt how we will ask, um, having felt how we will ask, we'll be seeing how Skyscape sounds. So at that point, I'll leave you with my conclusions and questions. Thank you very much.